my role and our role is to support everyone and help everyone be successful. And sometimes it does take um, the CEO because everyone is so busy trying to manage their own teams and their own areas um, that the CEO ends up being sometimes really the only one that can see the full picture. It's DeAndre here, and this is The Pioneers Show, the show where we talk with innovators, makers, entrepreneurs, basically people who are trailing their own trails and creating their own lives so that we all can learn how to work on our own lives. If this is your first time here, thank you for downloading and listening, and I appreciate you really taking the time to hear this episode. Subscribe and enjoy listening to The Pioneers of today. If you're a repeat listener, welcome back. This is the debut of the second season of The Pioneer Show, and I really could not be happier to be back online sharing these great stories with you. Really hope you enjoy this conversation. This is episode 25, and I'm your host, Andre Galpkerk. You can find me at It's DeAndre on Twitter, as well as the show at Pioneer Show on Instagram. Now, one question that many people have asked me is, how does one become an entrepreneur? To be honest, up until today, I still haven't found a secret formula. I don't believe you are born one, and sometimes you can become one, even if by accident. In today's show, I bring you João Barros, a scholar and teacher turned, according to him, accidental entrepreneur in a very exciting industry, the internet and moving things. Now, if you've never heard of IoT or Internet of Things, the shortened version is devices become connected and communicate and share data between them to better provide a service to you. Internet of Moving Things is taking this to another level using cars, for starters, to jumpstart this world of connected technology. João is the founder and CEO of Venium, one of the companies that, when I was living back in Portugal, was one of the big players that everybody knew about. In this conversation, we talk about how Venium was created, the learning that brought Venium to where it is now, and how the CEO role in a multi-continental industry operates. João is an incredibly nice person. I don't want to make you wait anymore. So let's jump straight in the conversation. So welcome to the Pioneer Show, João. How are you? I'm very well. How are you, André? I'm very good. Very excited. Actually, for people who don't know, uh, both me and João are Portuguese. So this is actually going to be a different pace for what I'm used to speaking with a Portuguese person in English. It's going to be fun. It's a great, great pleasure to have you here on the Pioneer Show. I've Even before I had the Pioneer Show, when I had the Portuguese podcast, I always said, whenever I go to, to Porto, I need to interview him. I need to interview him. It's like one of the basic names that everybody hears, like the get to know people in Portugal. So for people who don't know who you are, care to give us a presentation? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'm actually uh, an accidental entrepreneur because uh, uh, if you asked me 10 years ago, I thought that I would be a professor my whole life. I was actually very happy uh, as a researcher, as, as a professor. I've been working on wireless networks for about 20 years uh, and uh, uh, specifically on uh, networks of moving things um, since 2005 and had, you know, uh, big group of PhD students and postdocs working on that. Was very fortunate after my PhD in Germany to get a position at a university in Portugal that allowed me to collaborate also with several great um, research groups around the world. Uh, I spent some time at MIT, at Carnegie Mellon, at Stanford, and throughout those years basically developed a lot of the technology that ended up um, becoming, you know, products and, and, and cloud-based services here at Menium, but at the same time, uh, meeting a lot of super interesting and super inspiring people. And I'm also a father of three and mm-hmm. been married for 18 years now. And that's a really important part of my life as well. And, and always trying to find the balance between all these different things. Well, that's actually like straight away jumping into the personal part. I think that's something that a lot of people that want to jump into entrepreneurship nowadays, at least, I, th- I believe they tend to lack of, they say, oh, I want to be this entrepreneur, I want to be this A, B, or C person, but a lot of people don't consider a married person or have being a father or a mother, whatever it is, or a family person or a friend, very important. But I- I'm actually very happy that you said that, and it's it's something that I think lacks a lot on today's personal development of the future entrepreneurs, let's call it. Well, you know, I, I think it's life, right? <laughs> so ultimately, you know, yes, we, we're starting companies and we're entrepreneurs, but ultimately, you know, it's about, for me, it's very much about finding uh, a sense of purpose that is very well aligned with the things that I know that I can do well. Um, and and so uh, I, I never thought actually of, of going into the private sector and, 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 and starting a company until um, things economically started uh, going really badly for for Portugal mm-hmm. uh, back in 2011, and it hit our uh, education system really hard. Um, and 
and there was a, a Christmas party uh, that I organized for my students and postdocs where I invited my research group over to my house and everyone was so depressed uh, and saying, oh, we need to immigrate, uh, you know, they're cutting out investments, there are no jobs. Um, and I really felt I need to do something. So I told him, you know, 2012 is going to be the year where we're going to take all that amazing technology that you guys have been working on and we're going to bring it to the market. And I have no idea how to do that. But uh, in January uh, 1st, we're going to start. Um, and we did. And we started uh, two companies. One was Menium. The other one was Screenbolico, um, both in the Wi-Fi space. And, uh, uh, and I could sense right in that moment when I mentioned uh, that, that the level of energy and enthusiasm of people immediately went, went higher. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that's what I mean by a sense of purpose is that it, ultimately for me, it, it, uh, I've, I've always ended up falling in one way and the other in, in leadership positions, um, mm-hmm. mostly because I really cared. I felt that I was responsible um, I don't. I don't know that that's something that you can teach somebody, <laughs> but I always feel responsible, and that ties back to also being a father. Is is the, like this idea that you know that um, I'm I'm responsible for nurturing and, and growing um, not just ideas but also people, uh, and that's also where I feel the happiest is when I I have that that sense of purpose in my life. So so both both things go are tied and, and go closely together. That's very interesting. And regarding Venium specifically, because I think it's at least going back to the Portugal thing is that Venium is one of the big names that I always heard the big startups in Portugal. But to be honest, until quite recently, I didn't quite understand what it was. <laughs> so care to give us as well, like you did your presentation, a little bit of a presentation about Venium itself so that people that are listening to us can eventually be more integrated into the conversation. Sure, absolutely. So we are building what we call the Internet of Moving Things. Um, and step one is to enable vehicles to move massive amounts of data between uh, themselves and the cloud. Um, why is this important? It's because when you enable vehicles to uh, become uh, a communication network, and mm-hmm. move a lot of data, you start looking at vehicles not just as machines that carry people and goods from one point to the other, mm-hmm. uh, but actually as part of the internet and part of uh, the urban ecosystem. And so a vehicle can also be a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot providing connectivity to people. It can be a mobile sensor gathering urban data for all sorts of smart city applications that improve people's lives. They have cameras, they can improve our security uh, and safety. Uh, and, and most of all, we believe that the way our current transportation systems are organized are just not sustainable. Everyone owns a car and the car stays idle 95% of the time because you wake in the morning and come back in the evening. Um, As a society, we just can't um, endure this. And with climate change, there's no way that we can face that without fundamentally changing how we provide mobility. Um, And to be able to provide mobility as a service by shared vehicles, preferably autonomous vehicles as well, uh, you need the type of intelligent networking software that Venium uh, develops and and sells. Right now, we are laser sharp focused on putting our intelligent networking software into vehicles coming out of the factory in 2020, 2021. And so our customers are large car manufacturers. um, And we are now uh, very close to having our software uh, in millions of vehicles out there. So it's a really exciting time. That's incredible. But just, just if this is too, if this is confidential, something I'm, I will cut it out of the interview, no worries. But the main question that I have around that is that you're basically inputting specific hardware and software inside specific cars and specific brands. And then that those cars are connecting to the cloud via data, Wi-Fi hotspots, even using other future Wi-Fi disposing systems like the lo-fi project of light Wi-Fi. How, how are you doing all this inside a car? So up until now, the only uh, option that uh, automakers and mobility providers had to send data between the vehicles and the cloud uh, was to put a SIM card and mm-hmm. use the smartphone network. Um, and, and they used to look at Wi-Fi just to connect the smartphone to the car, uh, vehicle-to-vehicle communication just as a safety technology for vehicles to detect each other and avoid crashing. 
and, and they use cellular, so 4G LTE or 3G for everything else. And, and, and we have shown in our network deployments in Porto, in Singapore, in New York, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, where collectively we have more than 1,000 vehicles using our technology already, so buses, mm -hmm. tr garbage collection trucks, taxis, and so on. Uh, what we showed is that we can do a lot better than this. We can use Wi-Fi not just inside of the car, but also outside. There are millions of Wi-Fi hotspots available at street level, and with Menium's technology, car makers can now use this infrastructure in a very simple way. Uh, we've shown that uh, with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, we can actually build a mesh network of vehicles where vehicles actually share data among themselves and use each other as access points uh, for, the, for the internet. And that's what's so disruptive is actually that now uh, we're actually routing data uh, through all these different networks uh, in a very smart way. And moving data is more than connectivity. And typically, people talk about connectivity. And connectivity is just establishing a connection between the car and the internet. Um, and uh, moving data is a lot more than that. It's making all the smart decisions of what data do I send now, what data do I send later, uh, what data do I send through Wi-Fi? What data do I send for G? Uh, how do I share data among the vehicles so that I don't even need to go to the cloud, uh, say for real-time traffic information, for example, or software updates or map updates and things like that. Um, and so we, we've been able to, to really change the way that uh, the auto industry uh, has been looking at, at, at moving this data. And once uh, we do that, uh, or to be able to do that, we have to prove first um, a very strong business case. And, and, and what we showed is that just with Wi-Fi alone, we're able to save 40% of the data costs of OEMs, and with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, up to 90% of the costs. That brings the cost of data down to a point where now all sorts of other connected vehicle services like um, predictive maintenance, infotainment, uh, telematics, all sorts of... Uh, services that haven't been in the roadmap but didn't roll out because of the data costs, now they can become part of the standard feature set of new vehicles coming out of the factory. And that brings new revenue streams, and so it becomes very interesting for the automakers and mobility providers to use our software. That's very interesting. And, and two things that I want to touch upon is that, first of all, you don't need to comment on this, but I, th I find it really interesting that, like you said, you're not only talking about data out or data in, you're talking about both at the same time and the fact that cars can basically connect with each other and provide data to each other and from each other to each other and to someone else outside. And I think that's very valuable in, in even the, the ecosystem of technology and Wi-Fi and data if you have everything connected. There's an argument to be made in terms of too much data eventually and too much tracking eventually, but I think that you have a lot of value there in terms of the amount of information that you can even create. And t taking, for example, the, the, the example of self-driving cars, if you have so much data being interconnected, if you have specific measurements, you can even eventually have a system where it gets so much data that the cars can literally drive themselves easily, no problem, no need for hands on the steering wheel, no? Yeah, there's really no choice but to move a lot of data, especially for uh, autonomous vehicles, but already for automated driving assistance, um, where where basically you have all these sensors that are producing data, um, mm -hmm. and all and this information needs to be processed, and not all of it can be processed in the vehicle; it has to be processed in the cloud. And so, uh, for autonomous vehicles, there's also a trade-off between communication and computation. If the vehicle in front of me tells me, hey, I'm going to, at 20 kilometers per hour and I'm going to turn left, then I don't need to use fancy AI algorithms and lots of cameras and LADARs and other sensors to try to estimate that because I already have that information. That saves computation. And when you save computation, you save electrical power. And in an electrical vehicle, that means that your range is going to be longer because your battery lasts longer. Uh, and so there's a trade-off between communication, computation, and energy um, that people sometimes forget, and that, that, that is really important to know. So autonomous vehicles have to exchange about a terabyte of data at least um, with uh, the internet just to be able to operate. Um, and, and we're getting that from all of our uh, autonomous vehicle projects with different partners. Uh, and that means that the current network simply does don't scale. So to think that you know the cell phone network is going to be able to um, provide 
debt service for vehicles and at the same time for billions of consumers plus billions of other things that are going to be connected. Other devices, it's other people, not, other... It's not realistic. And so the timing for, for our product uh, and happens to be to be uh, great from that perspective is that everyone agrees that the data volumes are exploding. Everyone agrees that the current networks um, do not scale. And so uh, even 5G, where people are very, very hopeful that it will solve our problems, people know that it's not going to be available everywhere. It's, it's going to be very expensive. And 5G is uh, short range, right? So it's also very hard to maintain. Correct. So you will need a huge density of cell, cell stations, correct. Um, and so when you add all those pieces together, you realize um, there's space for innovation and there's a real need for a different approach. So, and re regarding Venium, v Venium, right? Venium. Correct, yeah. I, I don't want to say Venium and then be butchering the name. We actually don't know because this is a, a, a Latin word. And so um, I, I'm not sure that we know how the ancient Romans used to spell the, uh, the future tense of the verb to arrive or to get there, which is what Venium means. <laughs> but I like to say, but I like to say Venium. <laughs> so uh, assuming Venium, so just to be sure, You guys are developing also the hardware or also some hardware that's installed yeah, on vehicles? One of the things I wanted to tell you is that we are actually 100% software. Okay. Uh, we, we did develop onboard units in the beginning of our company uh, because we were targeting the aftermarket. We wanted to prove the concept first with fleets that already exist and mm -hmm. nobody was selling um, onboard devices that were multi-network. So onboard devices that could speak many different languages with different kinds of um, wireless technologies. Uh, and so we ended up making them ourselves, uh, but then quickly realized that, uh, you know, the hardware business uh, is, is low margin. And, and it's really cutthroat. Um, and, and once we proved that there was a business case um, for, for having multi-network uh, uh, communication units, actually lots of other uh, companies like Bosch and Denso and with whom we already partnered, um, are able to do the hardware units um, much cheaper and better than, than we can. So we focus 100% on the thing where we can be number one in the world, which is intelligent okay. networking software for vehicles. And coming back to this point specifically is that, and this is actually a question is that, are you developing a software, but is it going to be eventually, is it on a roadmap to develop the network itself so other people can eventually build apps and some kind of intelligence data on top of it? Or is the idea that you guys will develop everything in-house and develop a huge enough product that can tackle every situation and every kind of data that a car might get? So we are laser sharp focused on solving the problem of moving massive okay. amounts of data. So that's, that's the number one thing. Uh, and, and, I realize that if when you look at applications like over-the-air software updates or um, maps or uh, the uh, telematics and processing of, of onboard sensors, there are companies that are specialized just on those things that can, can do it much better than we can. The thing that we can do much better than anyone else is to make sure that all those applications have the data flows they need with the right quality of service at the right time with the right security level across whatever network and make it as simple as if the vehicle was using just one signal network. Um, now, where we are seeing a lot of room for expansion is that when you look at our IP, so we have about 180 uh, patents, um, they cover uh, networks of moving things. So not just uh, cars and autonomous vehicles, but actually also drones, robots, industrial machines. So there's lots of applications for us in um, the factories, in airports, ports, farms, mines. Um, and so uh, pretty soon we'll have to make a decision of whether we could create other business units to address this one of these verticals or whether we, we license our Uh, networks of moving things for others uh, to apply to other areas. Um, so this is still open. I've learned throughout the years that it's really important for companies to be very, very focused. And mm -hmm. um, that makes it simple also for the team to understand what, what, what we are doing and what is expected of them. Um, and, and so right now it really is about connected cars, but there are all these other verticals that we can tackle to further down the road.
And that's interesting that you, you mentioned eventually even licensing or creating other business units. And that's something that I think it's va very valuable for every entrepreneur or company or anyone that's listening to the podcast itself is that you need to be laser focused no matter where you are in the stage of a company. And eventually, if you see other verticals, I think it's like you said, better either you create a different business unit, which focuses solely on that and becomes the best at that. Or you can just say, hey, we'll let other people tackle this problem and we can still get some revenue because you're using our IP. Yeah, that's the, the yeah. Okay. And it has many different other, other aspects because all of these strategic decisions uh, have organizational implications, right? So, so what, when we decided to go 100% automotive industry, not do fleets and 100% software, not do hardware, that means that, you know, we need, uh, teams that are fo specifically focused on embedded software to put our software in, in the hardware units inside of cars with architectures that are defined by others. Uh, we need, in, 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 and we don't need a hardware team uh, to be focused on developing new hardware. Mm -hmm. And so all these have implications for the people who work with us. And that's often the most difficult piece also to to navigate and then but once you find it like right now we are in integration programs with five of the largest automakers in the world uh, we have partnerships with uh, important tier one suppliers then then you have to double down on that and so we're hiring very heavily right now and and so we need to double our engineering team uh, until the end of the year um, and looking for embedded for cloud uh, and the other aspects that i think are super important not often underestimated of course is product management Mm -hmm. and and sales um, and that's I think what 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 uh, really makes a huge difference is having a very clear customer a very clear product very clear strategy and then making sure that all of these positions you have outstanding people that what they're doing and that and there and, and enough people that are not doing things for the first time and that, that that's very very smart and, and I must congratulate you on 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 the things that you're doing. I just want to tackle a couple more things and then we can finish the interview because I know that you're a very busy yeah, person. Yeah, I do. I have a 4:30. So Okay, this is this is actually quite quite fast, yeah. don't worry. One yeah. of the questions that I have is that uh, you mentioned that you have you have cars from Portugal to Singapore to the US. How do you scale and what's the difference between launching in a market of even Asia Europe and US and where, how can people learn more about how to build scaling systems of those different markets and cultures? So our goal is to get to 100 million uh, vehicles within eight to 10 years. So I would say the first uh, rule is know where you want to get. Um, and then when you know that the auto industry produces 90 million connected vehicles starting in 2020, 2021 per year, then mm -hmm. you realize the fastest way to get there is to get a significant market share of the new vehicles coming out of the factory. Um, and that's when you then see, okay, with fleets, although there are 1 billion vehicles uh, out there, the sales cycle is too long. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then let's go with... Um, uh, another vertical where we can grow faster. And so I would say the number one is to make the strategy decision on what is the best market for you. Um, and, and so uh, regarding the culture, it is very different to deal with Americans or European or Asians. Uh, when you're uh, dealing with automakers, you practically do have to <laughs> deal with all these different uh, cultures because we, right now we're working with Japanese and with US and with French and with German and so on. It's like... Uh, you just you just get a sense for for that. I think we have no chance but to be learning new languages all the time. Sometimes it's actual you know languages like uh, uh, idioms. But uh, I see my job as constantly making bridges also between the language of the salespeople and the language of the engineers, mm -hmm. uh, between the language of automotive and the language of telecom, which are also not the same. Um, and and so I. I, I think that there's no no alternative but to uh, be talk adaptive. all these languages and learn all these languages. And that's really important for scaling. The other thing I think is not, uh, not to scale until you actually have product market fit mm -hmm. um, and, and be very, very conservative on cash uh, and make sure that you keep as much... Uh, cash as possible because most startups die because they scale and run out of money. Okay. Uh, now it's really simple. I'll ask you six questions. It's going to be like one question, quick answer. 
Cool. Okay. Tell me one to three books that have impacted your life the most. The Bible. <laughs> That's like the standard <laughs> standard response. Um, uh, for sure. I Tom Sawyer um, impacted me a lot when I was a kid. Uh, and I always felt like I, I have to do adventure and and, and, and and grow out of here. There's so many. Uh, I love the name of the rose. Uh, those are all nonfiction, even though the Bible is arguable. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on who you talk to, right? Recently, recently, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very inspired actually by poetry and, and by Irish poetry in particular, uh, John O'Donoghue, uh, and the books recently that I recommend to everyone are the books by David White, um, also an Irish poet that actually writes for a business audience. Uh, and it's a lot about, uh, about purpose, finding your own purpose and the purpose of, so if I could, you know, if I would recommend one right now, it would be uh, any any of the books of David White. Just pick one; <laughs> they're all all wonderful. I've, I've, I've read as many as I could. Fantastic. Uh, one last question, because I don't want to spoil it. Any, I know you might need to prepare. Tell me something you've changed your opinion in the last six months. I believe that CEOs have to be hands on, even when. Uh, the company is already relatively big or bigger. Uh, I went through a phase where I felt, okay, I need to delegate, delegate, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. Um, but I am finding that right now uh, it's really important to add things that are life of, or death <laughs> situations for the company, for the CEO to be very involved. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that you, and it's possible to do that. And let me say it this way. It's possible to do that without diminishing anyone on the team by making it very clear that uh, my role and our role is to support everyone and help everyone be successful. And sometimes it does take um, the CEO because everyone is so busy trying to manage their own teams and their own areas um, that the CEO ends up being sometimes really the only one that can see the full picture. Um, and I uh, didn't want to influence pe uh, people too much. And so I wanted to uh, give them enough space to make decisions, but realize that uh, if I don't uh, share what I'm seeing uh, when I'm seeing it, then often the price that uh, people pay and that the company pay is, 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 is much higher. And so I've changed my mind in respect of how close I should be to the action. And I'm closer now than I was two months ago. Well, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. I actually learned a lot and I was not expecting to learn as much and I'm not, and I was already expecting to learn a lot. So <laughs> thank you very much for your time. I want to just ask you to share where can people find more about you eventually find more about what job roles are open at Venium, Venium, sorry. And how can people eventually get in touch with you? Sure. Absolutely. So, uh, for jobs at Venium, so, uh, venium.com slash jobs, very easy. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I have a blog there as well. Uh, and, uh, I, just in general, uh, just mail me at uh, jbarros, J-B-A-R-R-O-S, at uh, venium.com. Uh, Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ron. All right. Thank you, Andres. Awesome. Take care. Thank you so much for plugging into this episode. I truly, truly hope you love this conversation as much as I did. João is truly an inspiring entrepreneur and I really, really hope you had a chance to learn as much as I did. Any information that you might have missed will probably be linked up in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, consider subscribing to make sure that this podcast grows and we can get some more people and help everyone be the pioneers of their lives and careers. If there's any feedback that you might have for me, please feel free to reach out on social media. A big thank you to João for his time and to Thibaut Frondlin, a.k.a. DJ Rodia, for the music of The Pioneer Show. So, until next time, talk to you later. Bye-bye.